I was working on a different project about uh, violence as catharsis, and I happened to be in Appalachia working on that project. I was in an area that was very significant, that had been viewed by the nation and the world as a place of poverty. I decided to start traveling around the region and kind of exploring what that meant. What did that look like? I got really fascinated or was sort of already becoming really fascinated by this idea of the fantasies that we have in our head or the fantasies that are, are built through uh, mass media and the reality of a place and how there's a tension between the two. It's my job or my interest to sort of mess with that or kind of untangle that and see what happens when you merge the two. What I try to do with the whole project is really kind of challenge the way that we buy into images and allow everyone to understand or kind of grapple with the fact that no matter where we are, we are constantly wrestling with the reality of a place and the fantasy that we create. Poverty is not a trait of character. It is created anew in each generation, but not by heredity, by circumstances. Once I got interested in the region and sort of became really drawn into this kind of conflict of like the reality and the fantasy of a place, I realized how interesting the story of Appalachia was and how, you know, it, it was just under 50 years that this War on Poverty initiative came into being through this really beautiful idealistic vision that sort of started with uh, John F. Kennedy. The story that really interested me in that was that the media, the media that I'm part of, uh, had done a lot of harm to this group of people by portraying them as one thing. It created this very us first them dichotomy and a real chip on the shoulder of people who lived in the region because they felt like everyone was looking at them as though they were this one thing, a poor, backwards group of people. Frank Collins. He's 38, lived in the mountains all his life. He has three children and a sick and pregnant wife. He worked the mines until they mechanized. Then, like thousands of others, he was thrown out of work. I think that the, the, the clearest thing that comes through from people in one-on-one -on -one interactions over and over again is this idea of the establishment. Because we're going to put a lot of coal miners and coal companies out of business. Right, Tim? They don't bring up race. They don't bring up immigration. But, but on the whole, it's people who have a real repulsion against Washington and the government. And that Hillary, you know, she just, there's no way around it. She stands for the tradition of politics that has done them wrong. I will be your partner and I will not for one minute give up on Appalachia. Not on your workers, your children, your retirees, or your communities. It's not that every white rural person is embracing Trump in any way, shape, or form. And I think there's a real split between people who are really adamantly supporting Trump and people who do find him frightening. A lot of people openly agree that he could really mess things up, but he isn't going to do any worse than Hillary. And people believe that he could potentially bring about healthy change. See, I come here, I get an award. It's probably a hat or it's probably a hard hat. I like hard hats. Let's see if it's a hard hat. It's a hard hat. It's a hard hat. I mean, the media has a lot going against them because they don't really have writers um, anchored or hunkered down in these kind of really rural environments, like really getting an understanding of why and how this has come to be this election. Even though I feel like I really know Appalachia because I've been traveling through every possible back road you could for seven years, I don't really know it at all. Even though I think I have this much realer picture than when I first started, this crazy fantasy still comes in.
in some cases, my fantasy goes back to this book called Christie, which is it's a book about a young missionary in 1912 going into the mountains and trying to teach the, these people who are not living the great American life. They're a little bit backwards. They don't know how to read and write. And it's this book where this young girl, she comes in and she teaches everybody how to live in this like capitalist world, you know? Ruby May says there's stores where you can eat anything you want. Yes, they're called restaurants. There are stores that sell books and stores that sell kitchen things and clothes. There's even one that I know about that sells candy right there. It's a wonder, Miss Christie. With all them fancy places, what'd you go leave Asheville for? Because the photojournalist is the same thing, right? Let me tell you what's wrong about this or what's right about this. I want to use photography to empower people to, to understand that their life can be better. But I don't know that that is very fair or right to a group of people, to any group of people. And I think it, it like bleeds colonialism. <laughs> At those times, I feel like my participation in these stories is not helping anything. But there are rare times where I read an article one that I've participated in or an article that was someone else's photographs where I am really taken aback and I really am um, put in a position to question my own beliefs and ideas. And so there is no clear answer on whether these articles or this kind of media coverage is helping bridge this divide. But I'm choosing to stay optimistic and I'm choosing to participate with my work, hoping that that is the case. Yesterday, I 